And welcome to another edition of Indie Sponge. This is Eric Lavallee for IonCinema.com. Um, we begin this week with uh, what appears to be the summer's um, litmus test, uh, the one film that'll decide whether cinema uh, begins again or continues or if we cancel everything out. Kevin Jaggernaut, I uh, let's dig into this. Um, has uh, Christopher Nolan's film become an unfair measuring stick for the 2020 summer season? Um, it's just become the film that everyone is sort of. Uh, it's sort of like the the beacon in the night kind of thing, where cinema owners are looking at it to be the film that gets everyone back into cinemas and sort of gets the industry, the movie going industry going again. Um, however, um, this week Variety reported that Warner Brothers will be making a final decision on whether or not Tenet stays with its July 20th release date or gets pushed. Um, and I think if it moves, uh, we're looking at the landscape changing again for what our expectations are with movie going. We can very much see how there would be a protracted or fractured uh, potential release for anything that comes out in July. Um, and then, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's the politics of it, of opening and not opening, particularly in the States. Um, there's the financial uh, angle, which, you know, in a lot of places where cinemas are opening, particularly in Europe where we see countries slowly setting dates, you know, they're opening at 25% capacity. Um, whether or not any cinema can continue, can make money on that is, is doubtful. Uh, they're probably gonna be losing money for months. And if they can, who knows if they can survive or if they'll even think it's financially viable to open. And then I think the other element too is, you know, there's no vaccine, there's no anything for this, for Corona. So does Warner Brothers want to be the studio that is also responsible possibly for sparking a second wave of infections somewhere? You know, like you don't want to be the movie where it's like, you know, 60 people go to see Tenet and they all get sick and some five people die or something, you know? That is not what you want. I'm sure Christopher Nolan doesn't want that as like, the uh, memory people take away from his film. And what's the experience going to be like? You know, like, do you really want to go see a big summer movie like Paranoid, wearing a face mask, you know, sitting in a half empty theater? I don't know. I don't know. It's there's a lot of questions. Well, let's talk about that, actually, because um, we could, I mean, between you and I, uh, if, if, and everyone watching the podcast. Obviously. But, um, <laughs> we'd be willing to take that chance if certain restrictions are put in, put in place. Now, I, take a, a, I don't know, a packed house of maybe five to 600 seats in an IMAX theater. If you spread that out and you have several screenings and you limit it to 50 people, I mean, there's, there's, it's almost uh, when you go grocery shopping, it's the same ratio, uh, chance ratio. Um, I, well, there, yeah. there's I mean, things I'm thinking of. I think I, I would agree with you. I would have agreed with you even maybe like two weeks ago, but man, like pe people just don't follow social distancing rules in general. I'm, it's pretty clear. And you know, these, these the staff at these cinemas and even, you know, they're teenagers, mostly at the chains. They're not being paid very well. And I just don't trust that, you know, at 9 p.m. at night, that theater is getting as rigorously cleaned as it was the, you know, in the morning when it opened. I just, I don't want to feel that way, but like, even on a regular day in cinemas, they're not very clean, you know? So I don't know how overnight they're they're magically going to become these sort of pristine places to sit for, you know, two to three hours, which is longer than you spend in a grocery store watching the film. I was thinking about how 
they make back their money. If, th if, if this costs 200 million, could, could something like a protracted, remember back in the day when, when Godfather would play and they would play for not weeks, but months. Um, and there'd be lineups to see these films. You think this film could develop into a scenario where they're playing at whichever movie house is open and um, sort of like uh, the studio decides that they're only going to be playing that film this uh, in in the summer of 2020. Do you think do you think that's uh, a scenario that would be possible? That it sort of like they drastically spread it out so that they sort of recoup, depending on which city is able to accommodate crowds again. Uh, that's an that's a great question. I mean, I think I was reading earlier today something that. New York and LA alone generally account for something like 10 to 20% of like domestic box office for uh, bigger films and probably for art house films too. Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, I think, yeah, I think studios are looking at two possibilities. One is they keep something like Tenet in, in theaters for months, but right now audiences at home are getting used to getting things right away on VOD. Like, um, we'll talk about it in a moment, but you know, studios are, are putting, you know, films that were gonna open theatrically onto VOD. So the question that Warner Brothers will have is, do we keep Tenet on in, in half full cinemas for six months? Or if we see that it's not making the money it should, do we shift quickly to, to, a, to a VOD release, which, Nolan would hate because he's not he firmly believes in the theatrical experience but the reality is there's just a lot of people who are not going to go. I could very much uh, picture uh, Nolan in front of theaters uh, handing out masks and um, uh, harken back to the days where Alfred Hitchcock was I think physically present for a couple of those psycho screenings and and um, asking patrons to not uh, divulge any of the secrets so it could be, um, we could be looking at something hardcore. And on to our next topic. So June 12th seems to be, appears to be a, a sort of like studio grud match. Um, we have the King of Staten Island. We have uh, Artemis Fowl, which is Disney Plus. And today it was announced that Spike Lee's The Five Bloods from Netflix is going to participate on that uh, June 12th date. Um, before we get into the land date of the um, of what Netflix decided to do, um, what were your early impressions on this project from Spike? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm always interested in a, in a Spike Lee film. I, uh, you know, great filmmaker. Um, that said, his recent run of films have been pretty hit and miss with me personally, mm -hmm. but. Um, you know, this, this is a, a, a Vietnam War tale. Um, it, again, like, you know, the thing about Spike Lee is he comes with pretty much every genre uh, subject matter through a very, very um, particular lens, which is all his own. So I'm definitely curious, uh, especially given that it was likely that it was going to show out of competition at Ken because he was supposed to be the, uh, the jury prize. So. Yeah, I mean it's a big title. It's a big. It's a big announcement from Netflix to just sort of drop it on there, and you know we'll see if it's one of these Oscar contenders that will be eligible now, because theoretically it was planned for some kind of theatrical, and now it's going straight to uh, your living room. I think uh, anticipation levels will perhaps be a little bit murky in terms of i'm not expecting another uh, black clansman in terms of uh, uh, status or clout um i remember this secretly being filmed back in march i think of 2019 so it's 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 ready it's in the can and um yeah i'm not too certain that people want to are curious enough about this project. I don't, I don't remember it being on too many of the uh, most anticipated lists at the beginning of the year. 
that said, um, he's had a sort of like resurgence with Criterion Collection uh, putting out his uh, his jewel of the, the his filmography. Um, there was like a lot of uh, ink written up on that, and I think there's uh, it's nice to see him in a in a sort of like reclaim some of that thunder that we knew him uh, knew him best from like his earlier work. Um, I also think part of the reason the film hasn't uh, generated a lot of buzz yet is. I mean, there's no trailer yet. It's mm -hmm. been pretty, like you said, it's been pretty, it's been keeping a low profile. So I think once we, that trailer hits and if it makes a splash, then we'll, we could see this one, you know, becoming something that people are going to want to fire up for sure. So this brings us back to uh, the, our earlier point, um, our earlier topic, uh, our discussion topic uh, about what the summer is going to look like and clearly netflix have an advantage they had uh, the lovebirds which was scheduled to play at i believe trebecca or south by i forget and they're going to be issuing that i believe uh, this month in may um but they have a lot of stuff in, I, I just wrote down a couple of titles here they have rebecca the dig the devil of all uh, the devil all the time the old guard I'm thinking of ending things, things heard and seen, Mank, Midnight Sky, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, The Prom, Last Days of American Crime. They have a lot of titles mm -hmm. um, that are more um, awards bait fallish, but seeing that how things are dropping, um, do you think that they might sort of like look at how, um, how Spike's film, um, Sort of like, like, will they be looking at that from a s statistical standpoint and uh, be outwardly thinking of, of perhaps playing around with, with films um, in their slate if, if there is no summer comp? Yeah, I mean, I think every studio is uh, trying to figure out where these films land. I mean, another, another film we haven't talked, another film on Netflix is Plate is also Hillbilly Elegy with um, Amy Adams, mm -hmm. which is based on a, on a pretty acclaimed book. So I think that Netflix's plan pot is just to, they're waiting like everyone else. They're, they're weighing the need to keep content coming to their platform because everyone is on, was watching Netflix right now and just ripping through whatever they can with you know, what does the Venice Film look like, Film Festival look like? What does Toronto Film Festival look like? Um, is there an opportunity for them to have a meaningful premiere for the, some of these films? Like, I would imagine that they're going to wait to see what the situation is before throwing Mank, David Fincher's Mank, on, onto a streaming um, debut or something like that. So it's it's... I think they have as many questions as everyone else. And I, I think you're right. I think uh, The Five Bloods is probably a litmus test for what people are cur what kind of film people are going to watch in the summer or not. Um, but yeah, but I also think they have room to wait it out. And they're much more flexible than like Warner Brothers, who has, you know, every, every one of their films has very strategically planned. Um, that's a good segue talking about Ron Howard's film. Ron Howard um, came up into the news stream. Normally I wouldn't care too much about um, his uh, filmography. Uh, he does put out a lot of films um, and he does have a lot of films where he gets attached to. Um, so Variety reported this week that um, He'd be taking on uh, a project called 13 Lies, which is based on the, the, the true events of 2018, where, uh, where a bunch of, uh, I think it was Boy Scouts or a, a touring guide of young, young people were stuck in that, uh, that cave in Thailand. And there was like this huge, um, this huge uh, bring them back to safety um, uh, operation. And it just sprouted so much interest from Hollywood. Um, I was counting the, the the number of studios that have their own separate projects, and we're up to three. I mean, it was an international incident, really. I mean, it captured the 
the the attention of everyone around the world um and all kinds of people were trying to to help to, to get to to save these kids um and i'll correct you a little bit there's already actually been a film about this released um it was a thai film it came out last year premiered at the the busan film festival i think so you know it's one of these it's it's one of these stories one of these major events that just by the nature of it just happens to spur multiple um projects mm-hmm. um and i think i mean it'll be interesting to see which one of these hollywood ones ends up taking the lead and gets cast and gets in front of cameras i think we know that Ron Howard, much like Ridley Scott, attaches himself to a lot of things. <laughs> so not all of them ever get made. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. So this one's signed or written by uh, William Nicholson, who gave us Gladiator, Mandela, mm-hmm. Broken Everest more recently, and I think his last film was Hope Gap. Uh, Hope Gap. Um, so you could sense the kind of storytelling that we might get in terms of uh, certain biopic elements, but also like the elements. Um, so out of these three projects we have, uh, so this is an MGM uh, bought the rights to, uh, to the, for this Ron Howard project. Netflix had uh, turned an original idea from a film and turned into a series with uh, John M. Chu um, and then you have the free solar, uh, fr- free solo um, filmmaker duo, who had something set up at Universal. So there's a, it's spurning a lot of interest. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm 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 trying to I'm trying to make sense of like, what is there beyond the headline? I I, I don't remember being especially moved, I, and and I sort of like forgot about it once that news stream was over with. Um, um, you heartless bastard. <laughs> but I think, I think, I mean, just the general nature of it, it just lends itself to some, it's, it's really good dramatic territory. I mean, it, it's a rescue of, of kids in a cave. I mean, it's, it's as, you know, it's, it's like the, the, there's a lot there that is sort of naturally cinematic, I think. And I think that's the allure of it. Um, for a lot of studios and filmmakers. So, I mean, we'll see. We'll see which one gets out there first, but um, yeah. Well, one thing's for sure, it's gonna be pitch black. Um, people will be speaking English. Um, Maybe. And, yeah, and uh, yeah, it'll be a highly stressful environment. Um, but I'm hoping maybe for a little bit like 72 hours, James Franco ask or or there was a Kevin McDonald ice climbing accident film that I, I was really big on. So Derek C in France has appeared to get a lot of buzz this week uh, for uh, the HBO miniseries. Um, I know this much is true. Features Mark Ruffalo and um, um, Times Two. Um, and there's sort of, there's, there's a trend going on right now where um, prestige filmmakers, if you want to call it that, are sort of associating themselves with some of the bigger uh, streaming platforms. Um, I'm thinking of, uh, more recently as uh, Reed Morano signed an overall deal with, uh, with Amazon Studios. So this week uh, it was announced um, that Cine France sort of like tied it up with uh, HBO. Um, obviously they're happy with that collaboration with that project. And so it appears that some filmmakers are sort of getting those like first look deals from with that you sometimes see with production houses. So I, I was wondering if you think that's a new norm where they're tying up uh, artists and obviously there's a beneficial factor to it. So perhaps, yeah, uh, HBO and CN France, is this a marriage made in heaven? Um, yeah, I mean, it's great. I mean, I, you know, as we both know, Derek C. in France, uh, his movies don't come at a very quick clip. Uh, he takes a lot of time to develop them. And, and he also probably hasn't been helped by a studio system that is definitely moving away from making the kinds of movies that he likes to do. Mm-hmm. But I mean, St. France has had a relationship with HBO for a while. He, years ago, uh, he was developing Muscle. It was sort of like this this uh, bodybuilding comedy. Uh, he was developing that at HBO and 
uh, it never got made, but there's clearly a relationship there. Um, and, you know, especially with HBO launching their new streaming service, getting someone like Steve in France uh, into their pocket for, for films or shows is great for them and really good for him. It gives him, gives him a place to, to develop and get his work out there. Um, you know, something like um, Empire of the Summer Moon, which, was, which is supposed to be his next feature, uh, and has been in development for a few years, you know, hopefully now that he has HBO behind him, that can really start moving forward. So yeah, I think it's a great match. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I'm looking forward to seeing what we, what he brings to the table. I never know how those deals work out. I don't know if he's just like, okay, I signed a deal and then he's offered a whole bunch of different projects, uh, uh, orphan projects or, you know, anything that's fresh. Um, I, I do know I have a preference, like we were talking about Jeff Nichols last week and I, I see him as a very singular uh, filmmaker. Um, his themes are, are, are entrenched, um, is, is, uh, is the struggle with family. Um, and he does have like a sort of like a larger scope um, uh, drama lineage uh, to, to like some of the uh, like American cinema from the seventies. And I sort of like, I like, I want to hold on to impressionistly because of like the Blue Valentines, but also The Place Beyond the Pines, uh, two films that, uh, that are are hard to market are hard to sort of like you know those 10 million dollar projects are, are are a thing of the past in a way so i'm sort of hoping that a deal like this will um will allow for certain leverage where he can either go back to a project that he has been developing or maybe go into another series like sort of like what jean-marc valley has been doing um for a while now yeah, Jean-Marc Vallée is a great example. I mean, um, he he's had a really healthy relationship with HBO and in, in developing projects, and but still retain you know his his kind of storytelling voice. So um, I think it's a it's a it's a great spot for uh, for Derek C. in France to be in for sure. Save the Green Planet, a two thousand three oddity cult film that played at genre festivals, that played at TIFF actually, um, and Rotterdam, um, is getting remade by the filmmaker himself. Um, the way it's packaged is really interesting. You have the CG entertainment people from South Korea, who, I mean, they, they had a huge 2019 with Parasite, um, but they sort of like teamed up with a new faction, um, a team that sort of like works with the within the horror curriculum so what were your initial thoughts when you saw that this filmmaker is going to be remaking his own film and um about how some of the partners are involved so uh yeah i mean so the filmmaker uh i'm going to pronounce this wrong but i'll try uh jun huan jang um so, so a filmmaker who's largely been on the i mean I think it's safe to say on the cult circuit um but this could this is a really good opportunity for him to step into a bigger marketplace work with more money bigger canvas that kind of thing um and you're right the partners on this are very interesting we have um ari aster who had the double whammy of uh hereditary and midsummer and we have uh lars nudsen nudsen um who are part of the parts and labor team, which is really interesting. So they've done everything from, you know, like Old Joy to Mike Mills Beginners to American Honey. Uh, they also, he also was part of Hereditary and Midsummer. But this is a guy who's, who's very entrenched in the American indie scene mm -hmm. as well. So it's a really, really interesting partnership um, between a huge South Korean uh studio cj entertainment is huge there and uh, you know two american indie guys um to bring this you know offbeat cult south korean film to american audiences so i reintroduced myself to the trailer because 2003 feels like ages ago um and i was sort of like looking at the material and thinking how is he going to rework it what's how how does it fit within a contemporary setting? Obviously, it's it's a maddening, crazy idea. But then I was thinking of Ari's film, Midsummer, and it's about 
people possessing your own body and and sort of um, those polar opposites. There, there's like that that fight between not good versus evil, but those who are possessed and those are who are trying to like unplug the system. Um, so I thought that was a really curious um, choice as as producing partners. Um, on a personal level, are you sort of like fed up with with English remakes of of foreign titles? Do, does do they do anything for you? I think it, it's a case by case basis. Uh, I'm not thrilled when it's like an acclaimed film that won you know festival laurels and things like this, and then the knee jerk reaction is to make an English remake. I think in this case. You know, Save the Green Planet is, um, it's a cult movie. Um, I'm sure it has people who really love the film, but I also think it's, you know, it's uh, 17 years since it was released. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's probably an opportunity to, to make the material, you know, connect with the current moment, the current zeitgeist with, with everything that's happening. Um, and if the filmmaker himself is making it, uh, and he feels that he, you know, can go through this material again and and do some things differently and try some things. Why not? You know, I'll, I'm willing. You know, um, but again, like, Save the Green Planet's on a personal film to me. I, I, uh, I haven't seen it, so I'm pretty open. I'm. I I, I think the the Ari Aster's involvement and in, in Lars uh, Nets and are the other elements too that make me curious about what they're going to cook up. And that's where that's where I agree with you, and um, I'm always like itzy about you know force like Rubens' film that was remade. I was like, ah, oh, do I want to see that? Finally, I wasn't impressed too much by that material. And then you know back in the day when when they mentioned that Cachet from Haneke was going to get a remake or Tony Erdman, I'm like, those things just infuriate me. But uh, in this case, I'll, I'll agree with you. It's the the producing team that that's coming aboard and sort of like shepherding the project stateside um it might make for uh, an interesting uh revamp hi i'm eric lavalle i'm editor-in-chief and site owner for ioncinema.com and this is kevin jaggernaut contributing writer for the playlist and together we are indie sponge